All right. Well, we're back. And good morning and welcome to Calvary Chapel, Quincy, California. Um, good to have you here this morning. And again, just a reminder that we have uh, following this service. Did this go off? It's, it's, it's my mitts here. We have following this service this morning uh, our annual business meeting where we discuss uh, what we did last year, our financial situation, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, if this is your home church, if you'd uh, like to attend that, you're more than welcome. And if you're just curious, you're also more than welcome because we simply have nothing to hide. And so uh, everyone is welcome to, uh, to attend. All right, if you would, turn with me in your Bibles this morning to the book of Titus, chapter 3. As we finish the pastoral epistles of the Apostle Paul, this has been an incredible journey through uh, these books, and I hope that, uh, that you've gotten a lot out of it as we've gone on this journey together. As you know by now, the theme of the book of Titus is church order. And in fact, that's the theme of the pastoral epistles, church order. God desires that his church be a church of order, and, and that is his order, his design, and so we, we, we derive that from his word. The key scripture is Titus 1.5. Uh, Paul, writing this, says, For this reason I left you, that is Titus, in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. So this epistle gives us the instructions for that work, that setting in order of the things that were lacking in the churches of Crete. And, and by the way, today, even today, the church still needs to hear these things. Uh, in Titus chapter 2, Paul commanded Titus to speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. Doctrine simply means teaching, sound teaching, teaching that is derived from the word of God. So specifically, those things having to do with the church and its members. So chapter 2, as you remember from going through chapter 2, is all about how we should live in relation uh, and in context as members of the church, as members of the body of Christ. <clears throat> chapter 3, then, is all about how we should live in context with the government and world around us the government and world around us so if you're not already there turn with me in your bible to the book of titus chapter 3 beginning in verse 1 and we'll get right to it because we've got a lot to cover this morning verse 1 says remind them so we all need to be reminded amen remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities to obey to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. So Paul commands this young pastor Titus to remind them. And the them, by the way, is the church, specifically the churches on Crete and, and by application, all churches uh, everywhere throughout the centuries. And this reminder, as I've already mentioned, is, is just as important for us today to hear and to obey. And there are seven reminders given that are broken into two sections. The first section deals with our relationship to government and, and in general, to, to authority. And the second, our relationship to all the various people whose lives our lives intersect. So first, first and foremost, we are to be subject to rulers and authorities. As, as Christians, you see, we have a responsibility to put ourselves under, and, and by the way, that's the Greek word hupatasso, translated as the English word subject, and it means under. We have a responsibility to put ourselves under rulers and authorities. And it's absolutely amazing how many Christians struggle with this simple command. We struggle with obeying the law. We struggle with being under authority. And specifically, government authority, when we 
may not approve of the government that's in power. Amen? <clears throat> in fact, turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Romans, chapter 13. Uh, we're going to look and uh, just read verses 1 through 8 together. Romans 13. Turn there in your Bibles, if you would. Romans 13, we're going to read verses 1 through 8. And again, this is Paul writing this. Let every soul, what's every mean? Every, okay. Let every, that, so that includes all of us, right? Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. So all authority ultimately is derived by God, because God is a God of order. Therefore, verse 2, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God. And those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he, that is the authority, is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore, you must be subject, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this, you also pay, what's it say, taxes. <laughs> see, see what a struggle that is? For they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. Render, therefore, to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Owe no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. So here Paul gives us seven reasons why people, especially Christians, are under obligation to respect and obey government. Number one, governing authorities are established by God. And that should be enough for us. Amen? Number two, those who resist authority are actually resisting the ordinance of God. Number three, those who oppose authority can bring judgment upon themselves. Number four, government is designed to, by God to restrain evil. Number five, government is designed to promote good. Number six, government is designed to punish evil. Not only restrain it, but to punish it. And number seven, we are called to obey, to be subject for conscience sake. And as I already mentioned, verses six and seven also mention that we're supposed to pay our taxes. And in verse seven, Paul also speaks about the issue of respect. Taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, and then he says, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Uh, and, and by the way, Paul wrote this when Emperor Nero was in charge of the Roman Empire. He was a cruel and evil emperor, and yet Paul makes no distinction that we are to give honor to only the honorable. Rather, we honor the office the authority, the structure that God has put in place. And at times, the person that is in that place doesn't seem worthy of honor, does he? Or she. And yet God calls upon us to honor that authority that is in place. And, and let God deal with removing those whom are not following him. Amen? Let God deal with that. He will. So as members of the church, we are called to obey government authority unless, unless it directly contradicts the teaching of the Word of God. Unless it directly contradicts the teaching of the Word of God. God said, thou shalt not kill. So we as believers in Jesus Christ will oppose abortion. Amen? Amen. Amen? So, unless it directly contradicts the Word of God. In fact, in the book of Acts, chapter 4, the ruling a Jewish body called the Sanhedrin commanded Peter and John 
to stop preaching in Jesus' name. In verse 19, Peter and John answered the Sanhedrin with this. They said, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. So you see, we have a divine command to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And when man tells us we cannot preach the gospel or we cannot preach in Jesus' name, we have a higher authority, a higher command. But in areas that government is not opposed to the word of God, we are then to obey, to pay our taxes, to honor, to show respect, to drive the speed limit. <laughs> amen? And everybody did. Nobody said amen. Did you hear that? I told you last week, I think I, I'm, that, I'm that poor guy you get behind that sets his cruise control on 55 on Highway 70 and just goes, and you all pile up behind me. <laughs> So we are to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey. We are also called to be ready for every good work. Uh, this indicates in context that, that, that we, the church, have a, a, a social role in society. We are to be known for doing good work. We are to be prepared. We are to be ready for every good work. The church should be a church that is filled with good works. It should be a church where good work abounds and where the community that the church exists in is aware of the good works. It's all part of our witness for Christ, you see. And it's a poor witness when all we do is complain about the government and do nothing to help our communities. Amen? And I, and I, I really believe this is an area that we as a church, and, and specifically me as a leader, the leader of this church, need to do a better job. We need to do a better job of, of seeing what needs are out there in our community and, and how we can best serve our community. Amen? We're also to be known by our character, to speak evil of no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. The words speak evil come from the Greek word blasphemo, which means us to speak hurtfully. And I don't know of a better description than many of the programs that, unfortunately, we all listen to on the radio. Uh, you know, and, and, and it's one thing when they're talking about policies that we disagree with, and it's another thing when they begin to speak hurtfully and uh, disrespectfully in, in so many different ways. And, and we sit and listen to those sometimes for hours. I know I turn on stuff in my car as I'm driving, and I'm listening to talk radio just like you. And at times, literally at times, I have to turn it off because I can't listen to what they're saying in such a disrespectful and, and mean way. God hasn't called us to that. He hasn't called us to speak evil of others. Speak evil of no one, the Bible says. You know, we alienate people from the good news, the gospel message, when we do that. I guarantee you that people will not listen to our message if we have offended them. We're also called to be peaceable. This is the Greek word, a machos, a machos. Uh, whenever the, the, the English we're just talk English and Greek, but English A is in front of a word in Greek. It means not. So literally, this means not macho, not macho. And that means exactly what you think it means. In other words, we're not to be walking about with an attitude, a swagger, an in-your-face type of contra confrontational style. We're not to be ready to pick a fight. We are to be peaceable. We are to be known by not fighting not by fighting. In addition, we're to be gentle. And, and this word means to give place, not to argue for our place, not to fight for our place, to, to step aside when it serves the gospel. We're not to be demanding our rights, our place, our anything, but we are to be ready to give up our place, to go the extra mile, that the witness of Christ might not be marred in any way. Amen? Amen. Lastly, in this section on our relationship uh, 
to the world in which we live, we are to be showing all humility to all men. What's all mean? All. It means all. The word humility can also be translated as the word meekness. It's the opposite of pride, you see. Humbleness should mark the Christian in their relationships with the people around them, with all men, meaning with all mankind. And all these things just mentioned, we do them for the gospel's sake. We do those for our witness for Jesus Christ, that we might be a good witness for Christ. In verse 3, Paul describes this, and he says, For we ourselves were also, just like the world around us, we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. We were all once just like the people in the world around us who need Christ. Amen? Give or take a little, one way or the other. But we were all like that. So Paul reminds us. He reminds us that, that God saved us. He saved us and we were just like that. Amen? And he saved us. And, th- and he wants to save others. And this is why our witness for Christ is so important why we need to be good witnesses and how we live in relationship to government and the world at large around us because we want to be good witnesses for Christ. And, and Christ, I don't know about you, but I, I mentioned this uh, Friday night, but when I got saved, I was a dirty, slimy, stinky, smelly fish swimming in the cesspool of this world. Maybe you weren't, but I was. And God saved sinners, and I was a sinner. And God saved you, and you were a sinner too. And there's sinners all around us in this world, on our our blocks, on our jobs, in the grocery store. We want to be good witnesses for Christ, that God would save some. Amen? So that's why these instructions are given to us. Paul says, we ourselves were also foolish, This means we were unthinking, we were unwise, and we made decisions just like the world around us today. We made decisions that were harmful and foolish. Also, we ourselves were once disobedient, meaning that we also didn't obey. In this case, the law, the government, and usually anyone else in authority over us. We were also once deceived. We thought we knew better, better than the law, better than those in authority. But we were being led astray. In our deception, we were also serving various lusts and pleasures. That speaks about heated passions. We were heated about so many things. For some, it was sexual. For others, it's political. And for others, it's social issues. Save the whales, the Green New Deal, electric cars, solar energy, etc. We were passionate about stuff, serving those things. But we were in bondage to those things. They ran our lives and they consumed us. As a result, we were then living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. And, and you know, unfortunately, we see this in our nation today. We see the division. We see the hatred one for another in our nation today. And, and we were just like that at one time. And our relationships became characterized by wickedness and ill will toward others, especially others in authority. We were envious of others and and just plain hateful of others. These are the things that characterized our lives, give or take. Your mileage may vary, amen, before we met Christ. But they should not be the things that characterize our lives after we are saved. We should behave in a dramatically different way than the world around us. Amen? People ought to be able to look at our lives and see that our lives are different than their lives. And, 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 and that should lead them to ask, what is it about your life that's so different? Why is it that in this situation you were not falling apart? Why is it that in this situation you were not irritated? Why is it that in this situation you are not hateful and angry and mad? How can you be so pleasant in the midst of this stuff, right? 
because we have Christ and because he's told us the end. Amen? We know how all this ends. We know where it's all going. Now look at verses 4 and 7, or 4 through 7. But, that's a word of contrast to our former life, but when the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. Having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. I don't know how Paul packs so much into a few sentences. So what changed us from being uh, foolish, disobedient, deceived, lust-serving, and pleasure-seeking, malice, envious, and hateful people to submitted citizens who are ready for every good work? What changed us? The kindness and the love of God our Savior. Amen? That's what changed us. The kindness and love of God our Savior. It was God's work in our lives. It wasn't a 12-step program. It wasn't a list of do's and don'ts. It was not through keeping the law. It was by the kindness and the love of God our Savior. In fact, we're told here that it was not by works of righteousness which we have done. We didn't get saved by doing righteous deeds. We didn't save ourselves. We didn't even clean up our own act. We were all dirty fish, and Jesus caught us and brought us into his boat and began to clean us. It was God who, according to his mercy, saved us. There were, there are, no amount of righteous acts that we can perform in order to merit salvation. If there were, we wouldn't need a Savior. Amen? If there were, Christ would not have died. You remember Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane? Father, if it be possible, take this cup from me. Three times he prayed that. Guess what? There wasn't any other way. It was not possible to save mankind without Jesus going to the cross. You see, you can't save yourself. If you could, you wouldn't need a Savior. But you do need a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. So it's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. And then he cleaned us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. See, we didn't, we didn't even wash ourselves. He, he caught us, and then he began to clean us, to clean us, our, to clean us up, to straighten us out. He regenerated us. We are born again. And as John 1.13 tells us, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man. So we didn't save ourselves, but of God. So what we see here is that salvation and sanctification even. That is how God cleans us up. Is a God thing from start to finish. Amen? It's a God thing. It's the act of God upon humanity that is incapable of saving itself. And notice also that this was all poured out on us, it says, abundantly, abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. God poured it out abundantly upon us. That doesn't sound like a little bit, does it? Sounds like a lot. And, and probably all of you can testify to the abundance of God's blessings poured out upon your life through Jesus Christ, your Savior. Lastly, we also see that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So by the free gift of God, that is his grace, we have been, that's past tense, when we got saved, we have been made just as if we never sinned. That's what the word justified means. There's a technical 
definition for that. It's a one-time act of God whereby he declares the sinner righteous because of his faith in Jesus Christ. But you can just simply think of it as just as if you never sinned. That's how God looks at you. Isn't that amazing? Can you believe that? You know yourself. You look in the mirror every morning just like I do. And I see myself. I know who I am. I know I'm not always perfect. And yet when God looks at me through Christ, he sees me just as if I never sinned because Christ took my sin and your sin upon himself at the cross. So we have been justified. And as a result, we have a future hope of eternal life. It says we should become, as future, heirs. We will inherit eternal life. You see, our hope will one day become our reality. Our hope will one day become our reality. And then Paul says this is a faithful saying. And these things, the things he's been speaking about, I want you to affirm constantly that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. So our relationship to government and authority ought to be characterized by obedience and our relationship to mankind ought to be characterized by good works. This is the message that Paul commands Titus to remind us of. And as we look at the status of the church today, we're in need of reminding on the subject, amen? You know, we can get, unfortunately, we in the church can get kind of Americanized, amen? And you know what I mean. They're going to pry my gun out of my dead hands, you know, kind of thing, you know? You know, we get, we get kind of Americanized, a, a, a kind of an Americanized version of Christianity where, you know, it's kind of the Wild West. But we need to come back to the Bible, what the Bible tells us, how the Bible tells us to live and to relate to, to government and to one another. Amen? Because that's our standard, not, not our society around us, but the Bible is always to be our standard. Paul says these are, this stuff is good and profitable to men. It's right, lawful. And, and we should not have problems with authorities if we do what is good. Amen? Now, we will have problems. In, in the world ye shall have tribulation. Jesus said, if they persecuted me, they'll persecute you. Th that stuff is going to happen. But don't let it happen because of you. Amen? Don't go to jail because you've been going 100 miles on highway, an hour on Highway 70, right? I mean, that's your fault. That's not God's fault. God told you what the speed limit was. He had them put up signs everywhere. <laughs> so don't, don't make sure it's not your fault that you're in trouble with the law. Amen? Paul wanted Titus to affirm constantly these things. These were things that we all apparently need and need to hear again and again and again. And you know, I was going to continue uh, and finish this chapter this morning, but in the interest of time, I think we'll stop there and finish the chapter next week, and uh, we'll get the worship team up here for one uh, last song, and then we'll have our annual business meeting today. So let's, let's finish this next week. There's a few more things that I want to get into with you as Paul concludes this chapter that it will just take a little bit more time. So let's go ahead and pray, have the worship team come back up, and we'll finish this next week. Heavenly Father, we once again want to thank you for your word. And, and sometimes, Lord, it's, it's difficult for us to hear. We, we see our shortcomings as, as we uh, hold our own lives up next to your word. We see the areas in our life where we just don't, uh, just don't match up exactly. But we pray, God, that you would help each and every one of us Help us to live these things uh, that we've read this morning and to be good citizens, not only good citizens of heaven, but good citizens in the communities in which you have placed us down here on earth, to be peaceable with all men, uh, to show your love, to be a good witness for Jesus Christ in all that we do. And I pray these things now in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And everybody said, Amen, amen. amen. <clears throat>
We'll go ahead and stand for this last song. I think it's significant that in Titus 3, 5, as Pastor was relaying to us, Paul writes that he saved us, not me. He saved us. It means all of us together are one body so we can worship and sing how good it is.